we will see the last one. We, I'm sure we will have bus to the, um, to the Disneyland. Okay, uh, thanks you all for staying here. There is a bus at 6, 10, 20 that we can take. Uh, I hope you can see that. Uh, so, um, I'm giving this talk for uh, my postdoc, Wenpeg, uh, that couldn't be here, and my undergraduate, Jamal Hay, uh, that worked with us uh, on this. Uh, so hopefully, oh, and this is important, uh, hopefully all of you are thinking from time to time at least on, on what's important to advance uh, natural language processing. And I'd like to suggest that one of the things uh, that should be in your top three at least is thinking about supervision. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about supervision in the context of uh, text classification. So text classification is really an important task. A lot of the work that you've seen in this conference and you will see in future conferences have to do with various types of text classification from categorization into topics to identifying intentions to identifying abusing text, framing news stories, uh, and so on. So this is a list uh, of frame classes that was shown in, in an earlier paper in this conference, uh, in Cornell actually. Um, and so we have to, to address this. Um, and if you look at the frame classes, uh, you will see that you actually understand them. What is mental health? What is race, ethnicity? What is the public opinion? Uh, so while you understand the labels, models are not even given information about the labels. So NLP today views these tasks simply as multi-class classification tasks. Uh, example, here is a document. If you look at it and you're given a taxonomy, you can easily recognize that this is about tennis, about sports. Here's another example, another piece of document. Use the same taxonomy and you can figure out that this document is about money, about healthcare. However, the way our models address it or the way we address it in, in NLP, we basically map it to a traditional text categorization uh, problem. We map the labels into numbers, one, two, three, four K. Uh, someone needs to label the data. Uh, and then all your model knows at the end is how to classify into these numbers, one, two, three, four uh, K. And now, of course, uh, you can easily classify these documents without any task-specific information uh, since you have an understanding of the labels. Um, but we can actually do that. So, so in a work that goes back more than 10 years ago now, AAAI 08, we actually argue that you can take documents, take a taxonomy, and map the labels into some semantic representation, map the document into some semantic representation of the document in the same space, and then basically do nearest neighbors between choose the label that is the closest to the representation of the document. Um, now, of course, the key question here is what are good semantic representations? Uh, and today we've, we are spending a lot of our time on looking at semantic representation, so we, we have good answers. Originally, we used a, a Wikipedia-based representation that is called uh, ESA. Um, now, the, good, the nice thing about this is that it works great for topic categorizations. Uh, it's competitive with supervised approaches, as long as you don't have too much uh, training data, more than 1,000 or 2,000 examples per label. You can even use this for cross-lingual uh, models. Um, however, we want to go beyond just classifying topics. Um, so the first step in this work is that we are, we are observing that actually text classification comes in multiple types. Uh, for example, in topic classification, we're thinking that the document is about something, about tennis, about religion, about banking. The vocabulary in this case is going to be related to, to the label. On the other hand, other types of text classification, the document is happy or the document is harassing and so on. And in this case, the vocabulary in the document will not mention the word harassment. It will just be uh, a harassing document. So um, this distinction, of course, goes unnoticed if all you do is a multi-class classifier. Just give it data, give it labels, and it's going to classify it. Um, but that means that you need a lot of examples. So, so can we do better? Can we deal without uh, a lot of examples? And this is what we're trying to do here, basically develop a paradigm for zero-shot text classification. 
So there are multiple challenges. The key one is that we need to start thinking about label-aware classification. So we need models that understand the labels. Now think about it. Our, our community as a whole spends a lot of the time today trying to represent input data. But we don't represent the task. And what we're suggesting here is that you have to think about how to represent the task. Uh, and of, as I suggested earlier, it's easy to do for topics. It's harder to do for other types of uh, text classification. And here we want to be able to look at a piece of text, identify topics, but also identify the emotions expressed in it, uh, identify situations, and so on. Um, a second challenge is methodological. What is zero-shot uh, classification? And the community has suggested multiple definitions. One of them, which I call here definition one, uh, we assume that we get, we have a multi-class classification problem. We get labels for some of the, lab we get label for some of the classes, but no for, not for the others. This is typically used in computer vision, where it kind of makes sense because there are relations between labels. We would like to move to definition two, which uh, I think is uh, a better one, where we want to classify into a given set of labels without having observed any uh, labels uh, in this set. And of course, there are other methodological issues with a variety of data sets, a, a range of evaluation uh, methods that do not uh, agree with each other. So, so the focus in this work is to really think more about supervision um, which, as I said, I think is one of the most important issues to think about today. Uh, uh, current paradigms are unrealistic and, and do not scale, and we think that, that we all need to think more about what I call incidental supervision, and zero-shot text classification is one example of that. We need to think about types of classifications, um, and we need to improve and unify the settings. And most importantly, from a technical perspective, we need to suggest a paradigm. And this is what I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about data. We released three data sets uh, of different types for uh, zero-shot text classification. A little bit about evaluation and uh, about our technical approach, where we propose a textual entailment approach to text classification. Um, Okay, so, so just to talk about uh, data sets, we, we proposed three data sets that in fact we did not put together. We adopted uh, data sets that existed. Uh, the first one is for topics that is based on the Yahoo uh, taxonomy. It has 10 classes. Um, the second one has to do with emotions. Uh, again, it has 10 classes, including a none. Um, and finally, uh, a data set uh, that was adopted from a Lorelei, DARPA Lorelei data set on situation frame detections. Basically, it has to do with events uh, or event type classification. And again, there are uh, 12 uh, different labels. Okay, uh, so this is a summary of the data sets. Some of them are balanced, some are not. Uh, uh, it gives a variety of types of classification, so it's more challenging than uh, just topic classification. Um, to talk about evaluation, so, so really we, are, we are dealing here with two types of evaluation. The first one, which we call here partially obscene, corresponds to my first definition. Some of the labels have been observed, some were never observed, uh, and we want to be able to evaluate separately on the seen and the unseen uh, labels. The second one, which I think is the more challenging and more interesting type of evaluation, is fully unseen. Uh, this is basically the definition that goes back to our work 10 years ago that we call dataless. Uh, the idea is that none of the labels has been observed, uh, and we still want to be able to classify into these labels. Okay, so, so as I said, we prefer the second one. Uh, we think this is a, real, uh, a realistic setting. We should be able to handle the challenge of classifying into a taxonomy without having any task-specific annotation because we understand what the task is. Um, okay, um, and, and the technical approach that we are suggesting here is a textual entailment based. Uh, so, so really, if you think about it, textual entailment uh, or text classification is inherently a textual entailment problem, right? So given a document or a text snippets, 
uh, classifying is really equivalent to determining at the truth value of a hypothesis. So given a document, you want to know, is this document about tennis? Uh, does it express joy? Does it constitute harassment? Uh, so basically, it's a textual entailment uh, problem. And if you had a program that knows how to determine textual entailment, you can then classify into any given label or in the context of textual entailment, you call it a hypothesis. Of course, you also need to know or understand the meaning of this hypothesis. And this basically suggests that there are two steps that we have to follow if we want to address uh, these problems. We want to develop a model that knows the trick of determining textual entailment. You can learn the trick of doing it, whether A implies B, outside our task. You, you can learn it uh, from other data sets, completely unrelated to, to the task at hand. And two, we have to be able to understand the label. And again, it's going to be independent of the task at hand. It, the label itself is going to be given somehow as part of the input to the problem. Um, so, so that uh, means that we have two steps in our process. First of all, we have to teach our model textual entailment. And you can do this on a lot of data sets that exist today. We, we use BERT as a starting point, and, you, and we tune BERT on several textual entailment data sets. In this case, we're using MNLI, the RTE, which is, uh, we're not using the original one, we're using the GLUE version of RTE, and we're using Fever. Um, if we are in the partially unseen uh, setting, we also fine-tune on the seen annotated data, then evaluate on the other part. If we are uh, in the fully unseen, we just evaluate directly on the labels. Uh, and the second part, we have to define the hypothesis. This is part of understanding the labels. And, and essentially, uh, what we have to do is we have to map the labels into hypotheses. Um, so, so we use templates to take labels, map them into hypotheses, and the type of template is a function of the type of the classification. So if it's a topic, we will say that the, the hypothesis could be the text is about something. If it's an emotion, this text expresses something and so on. And then we can substitute for this question mark part either the word itself or a definition. And in this case, we're using a WordNet based definitions of the labels. And of course, you can choose your own way of, of mapping to hypotheses. Could be more expressive than what we're doing here. Okay, so, so a little bit about experiments. Um, so I'm actually going to focus on the second uh, experiment, which is more interesting, uh, just for the case of uh, the fully unseen case. So the top three lines actually are only representations. Uh, essentially, uh, we map labels into representation, we map document into representation, and you can see, and, and we do nearest neighbors. You can see that this, already this is quite solid, especially for topics. Remember that there are 10 to 12 different labels, uh, and not so good, uh, for example, for emotions. Uh, in the second case, we're actually training a model, but we train a model that is unaware of the task at hand. We collect 100K wiki, uh, Wikipedia articles. We use their categories, their labels, and we just learn a model. Um, and once we have this model, we use it on the labels that are given to us uh, as input. And as you can see, the results for topics are actually pretty good. And the reason is that Wikipedia cat categories and Yahoo topics actually are quite similar. Of course, the results drop significantly when you move to emotion situation that are different types of, of uh, classification problems. And the last group of results are really the textual entailment formulations. And you can see that this uh, makes a big difference. Um, and you can also notice that different fine-tuning data sets also make a difference. In this case, RTE, even though it's much smaller, it's the best data set to tune on. And then Fever and finally uh, MNLI. But the results when we tune on all of them are even, uh, even better. Uh, there are many things to think about, many challenges. I want to highlight one of them, which is um, how to map labels to hypotheses. So here we use two ways. One of them, just the word itself. The second one takes the definition into account. And if you look at this, you see that actually the, the, uh, using definition isn't as trivial. 
Here is an example of why it's not trivial. Rather than using the label sport, you can think about the definition, and the definition here is quite complex. An active divergence requiring physical extortion and competition is not uh, a trivial definition. Anyhow, together they do better uh, than each one of them, and this is one of the things that you may want to think about. To summarize, um, I suggested that thinking about supervision is important. We should spend time on it. We try to standardize the study of zero-shot text classification by first benchmarking data sets and evaluation, and mostly by proposing uh, a textual uh, entailment formulation uh, and sh that, that was shown to be quite effective in zero-shot uh, learning. Uh, I think about this really as a form of incidental supervisions, and it is able to exploit existing data set that are independent of the task uh, and perform test agnostic real zero-shot classification. Data in corner released, uh, and please look at them, and thank you. Thank you. So any questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So have you thought of using other tasks like question answering? It would be, in my opinion, just a, as a good a task. Entailment is a little complicated, maybe. I, I, I think you can do question, uh, for the same price, you can do question answering. It's equivalent, in my view. Right. Uh, I think it's a little bit easier to think about it as sexual entailment, but go ahead and try QA and let's see. I, I think it's going to work as well. Okay. We don't need to. Okay, thank you for the great talk. Uh, you just talk about replacing the label by the definition. So you know there are many ways to express uh, the dictionary definition. Have you ever tried it and do you think there is a difference? Yeah, I actually I think this is one of the key challenges here. We played with a few ways of doing it. Uh, and uh, I think the jury is still out here. I mean, this is something that uh, will definitely be improved if we know how to map labels to better representation, to better hypothesis. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So I actually have a question for uh, setup in, in, in computer vision. So in computer vision, zero shot classification usually occurs in, for example, you have uh, training data for computers and uh, you have some uh, unlabeled data with the with the label such as laptop, which is related but have some differences, but there is no training data for laptop. For, but in this case, um, do you think we can just uh, to use any other text classification data and into the zero shot classification task? Yes. So, so, so I think in vision, the work is a little bit easier because if you know how to, if you get, get label data for dogs, you know a lot about classifying cats, even if you've never seen it. Yes. In NLP, most of the categories are discrete and could be very different from each other. So the experiments that I showed that uses uh, Wikipedia categories is an example where we can get help in NLP. So we basically learned a model that knows about Wikipedia categories. And it turns out that this model uh, knows quite a bit about uh, other categories. So this is a way to do it in a way that it's completely uh, independent of the task, does not require anyone to annotate the data for you. Uh, and as I said, these are preliminary experiments. I think there's a lot more things to do here to explore this. Such as using pre-training model? Um, so, so we are using pre-trained model for BERT. Uh -huh. the, the only condition I have here is that I don't want to know, I don't want to get annotated data for the labels. Yeah. Beyond that, you can do whatever you want. And, and what we've shown here is that using textual entailment is a useful way of doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Go to Disneyland. So thank you, so that's all for the session, and we're all set for the Disneyland. <laughs>